Hello, and welcome to the Learn It All podcast. I'm your host, Damon Lemby, and I'm excited for today's episode. We got a great guest. His name is Mike Phillips. Mike's been podcasting for over 15 years, and he's got a great show called The Leadership Toolkit. During our conversation, we, we touch on everything from what are the key traits to be a great leader and how that's evolved over time. We get in the feedback. We talk a lot about mentorship and getting comfortable with failure, which I think is crucial for leaders. A lot of people have a have a hard time with failure. And I think Mike's got some great tips around that. I also really like Mike's double A, action and attitude. So if you're somebody interested in leadership, whether you're just getting started or you've been a leader for 20 years, or maybe even a high school hockey coach, you're gonna wanna stick around for this episode. I think Mike's got some great advice and I'm super excited to share it with you. So Mike, welcome to the show. How are you, buddy? I'm doing fantastic, Damon. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm stoked that you reached out to me and we just, the few minutes we got to connect beforehand, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. It's, no, it's great to have you. Well, let's just dive in. So sure. Mike, you have, you have coached, trained, and interviewed thousands of leaders. What, what are you seeing that are the common and key traits that great leaders possess? You know, I think first and foremost, when it comes to leadership, the greatest leaders first know themselves. They're able to have a very high uh, emotional intelligence. You're, they're able to be in touch and, and lead themselves first. They're always, I love the fact that this is the Learn It All podcast because I think great leaders are always learners. There are people that are constantly seeking knowledge. There's never an end. You know, I think so often we get into roles. You mentioned sales and management, and we get into these roles and we think, well, gosh, I just want to learn everything that there is so that I can become an expert, right? And we look for that title or we chase that uh, whatever it is at the end, the, the, the certificate, the degree, the, we're chasing this one thing and the best leaders are the ones that realize, okay, well, that's, that's nice. But once you've made it to that point, you can always look out. I think I've shared this analogy before. I don't know if you've heard this, Damon, but like it's you're climbing to the top of the mountain, right? And when you get to the top of the mountain, you're able to look out and you see, hey, there's other mountaintops out there. I can still go chase other things. And so the, the people that really know themselves, uh, because if you, you can't lead others until you can lead yourself. And the people that realize that they are, they're always going to be learning. They're an avid student. I think those things are very important. I think, I mean, we could, for goodness sake, we could go on this whole podcast for, for an hour about what are great qualities. I think probably a third one is, uh, I, I really like this one and I'm going to go with it. And there's, there's many, many more, but I think the third one that I, I stick with, and it, this is something that's really hit me in the last year, is leaders are people that get results from others. And I think we look at all of the soft skills from time to time. We look at, you know, charisma, and they're well-spoken, and they're empathetic, and, and some of those uh, less tangible items. But I do think it's something that you got to lead yourself, you have to be an avid learner, and you do have to get results on some level. You have to be able to bring other people along. It's one thing to talk about. It's another thing to do it and take action. I couldn't agree more. And starting with self-awareness, I think to be a great leader, you have to have self-awareness, right? Um, Absolutely. As well as, you know, my book, The Learn It All Leader, th that's why I talk about quite a bit is I think leaders are always growing and they learn, they understand that they don't have all the answers and there's nothing wrong with having not having all the answers and, and being vulnerable and asking for help, right? Absolutely. Well, I, and I think so often we get that identity. People that are in leadership roles or in management roles, we, we start to get that identity from other people, right? Those that we're leading. And they go, well, I'll go to Damon. He's always got the answers, right? And so that's how you then start to identify. And in some ways, we start to get this facade of, well, gosh, now they're coming to me. I got to have all the answers. And it's okay to stay, step back and make sure and keep that humility, right? Be humble and say, hey, I don't know the answer to this one, but I know it, it, here's the key. The best leaders are the ones that will give you the advice and the direction on where to go get it. And they're deliberate on 
where it is that they're directing you. So you're, they're not just, oh gosh, I don't know the answer. Go, go figure it out. You know, uh, Damon, I don't know the answer to that one or whatnot, but we, we start to get identified. And, and I think a lot of leaders fall in that. I've fallen in that trap of, well, gosh, you know, they, they think I have all the answers. So I got to keep up that, mm -hmm. um, that view, that outlook of that. I, I, okay, well, if they're coming to me, I got to have all the answers and it's okay to step back and just say, Hey, you know what? I don't know this one, but here's the best place that I think you'd get it. And if we, if we're really uh, emotionally intelligent, if we're really self-aware, it's okay to realize, Hey, where did I go when I was asking that same question? Cause most of the time we've, you know, as humans, we all have a lot of similar questions. Uh, it's, it's really important on where we go to seek those answers. I totally agree. I think with vulnerability and humility, especially for new leaders, say you move in, Mike, you move into a new role, maybe you're promoted mm -hmm. into leadership for the first time. And sometimes you can even be dealing with imposter syndrome and you're thinking to yourself, wow, do I even belong here? And then you want to come across as having all the answers, because if you don't have all the answers, you might perceive your team as thinking, well, this guy, this woman doesn't know what they're talking about. But getting back to vulnerability, I think it's a a, a fine mix. You want to be vulnerable, but you also want to be able to show confidence that your team knows that um, that they can trust and that you can get things done. Like you said, execute. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that you you bring that up specifically, and as far as vulnerability and confidence, on on my own show, on my podcast, that conversation has come up many times in this last year. Uh, I interviewed an author that specifically wrote a, a book on on leadership vulnerability, Jacob Morgan, and w we were sitting and talking about this. And there is a fine line, you know. There's a fine line between being wishy washy and never having the answer, and being confident in knowing what your abilities are, or at least getting somebody to seventy five or eighty percent. And if you're, you you have to understand, and it, it, uh, that's how I weigh it. Like if I can't figure out something at 75%, if I can't be effective at 75% or better, then I need to be looking for somebody else that can. And so if, if somebody comes to me and asks a question regarding a subject, they were coming, I told you, I was listening to your last podcast with the, the gentleman you said, Hunter was his name. Hunter Hastings. Great guy. Hunter, Phenomenal. Absolutely brilliant. But when he, you know, he's talking about the, he's an economist, like that's something I would have no knowledge of. So I have to, rather than, than trying to, to navigate my way through that sort of discussion, I have to know, oh, well, Hey, I, here's, here's a person that I can connect with. And here's, I, I almost think it builds you up better as a leader based on who you are able to call on in that network. Like, Hey, I don't have the answer, but let me tell you, I know this person, I know Hunter Hastings. He is an absolute badass, right? And so here's who you would go seek this out from. And and so often, especially if it's somebody that's new to a leadership role, they're they're chasing the title more than they are the the all of the actions and execution and the whole scope of what it is they're supposed to be doing. They say, "Well, I got this." And for the for lack of a better term, Damon, they're they're using the you know, well, I got the manager title, right? Usually we get to be a manager, and then that's when people in business will start to view themselves as a leader. And um, so so they chase that manager title rather than what are the things that a really good manager and leader does? What are the activities they engage in? When is it, you know, who are the people that, that are the best that I've listened to or that I know that I could lean on to get the right answers and then be vulnerable enough to spread that information? You know, you brought up that vulnerability. It, there's, a, there's a fine line to go back to vulnerability between being vulnerable to say, well, I don't know and... I don't like the word, but I don't know. And here's where you can go to get the answer versus I don't know. Stop versus, oh, you go figure it out. You know, those are two different sides of the coin for sure, in my opinion. And I love what you're talking about earlier around how great leaders are always literally what I heard you say is they're curious, right? They're always learning and they have a passion for learning. And I, I think that great leaders have a tendency as well if you're dropped in a room with a Hunter Hastings or a art aficionado or whatever, you can learn something from everything, right, Mike? What advice do you have for our listeners out there 
who are have situations like that and, and need to better understand how they could take advantage of just tapping into the people they're with? I think 100% leaders are curious. It goes back to, I, I love this clip, and I know I'm going to go, I go off on these tangents, Damon, so just ride with me, man. Yeah. Um, there's a clip of, I, I think it's Ted Lasso. Okay. Where he talks about being curious. They're playing darts. You know what I'm talking about? Are, are you of familiar course. with the clip? Of course. Yeah. And they make this bet on playing darts. And, you know, the whole, whatever it is, bar. I, I've never even seen the whole show, but I've seen the clip and it sticks out. And he's talking about, you know, the best, best, li- I think he says the best, uh, most intelligent people are curious. Because if that, if that was the case, you would have asked the question, hey, Ted, you played a lot of darts? To that, I'd say, yep, every Sunday afternoon with my father till I was, you know, 15 years old or whatnot. And so I think it boils down to if you want better answers and you want to learn more, it's important to ask better questions. And I think so often we'll meet somebody and we're enamored with their persona or we're excited about what their, uh, what we perceive them to be. And we ask a lot of stuff on the surface because sometimes we don't want to hurt feelings or we don't want to seem dumb. Right. Let's, let's be like ego gets in the way of, of learning. It really does. And so we have to be willing to bruise our egos a little bit and say, okay, well, let me ask some really good questions of this person and connect with them. And one of the things that I've always found, and this goes back to sales, you said we could get into sales and management. I think leadership ties right into sales. If you want to, uh, someone to be interested in you and share their knowledge, then show an interest in them, show a genuine interest. If you show a genuine interest in that person, just like before we went uh, on the show here, Damon, you and I were sitting and talking and my goodness, I have no shortage of the words you asked, you, you know, you were just asking about me. And that's one of the things that I think human nature is, yeah, people will love to tell you about themselves. So when you take a genuine interest, then you become interesting to them. And most people are more than willing to share their knowledge. They're more than willing. It's, it's, you know, it comes down to remove that veil of fear of, well, gosh, if I ask this question, it might seem dumb. Ask the question, you know? Absolutely. And that kind of ties into one of the questions I had for you. How important are mentors in your life, in your career, especially again, oh, for new leaders? Uh, I think significantly important. And there's so many different um, directions I could go with this. You know, for myself, I I think we can find mentors in many, many different places. And I think it's really important that once you've, quote unquote, made it into management or leadership, that's when you need a mentor at the next level the most. So often, and I've shared this analogy before, Damon, we get to this spot, right? It's like climbing the, the ladder. We get to this spot and then we're looking way up and we go, oh, man. That's the next place I got to get to. I got to find this person to take me so much higher up and we're reaching and we just can't quite reach it. And the reality is we're looking so far past it. The next rung's just right here that if we stepped up onto it, we would be able to grab it. And so you don't always have to look for this person. that's just a rocket ship. You have to look at who's the person that can add value to you. And in turn, you can add some value to them. Mentor, mentee relationship, right? When, When we talk about mentors, we've all heard the saying, that uh, we've all heard that we're the sum of our five closest peers, right? Right. Well, that's one of those things that it comes down to. Okay, well, who are your five closest peers and what are they able to mentor you on? And then I've always said too, what can I in turn you know, af- offer value to them? What, And not necessarily can I mentor them on, but th- th- those mentor relationships, they can start at a very – grassroots level. And so that's something because you have an opportunity to learn something from everybody. I mean, you said if you go into a room, 100%. if you go into a room, you can learn something from everyone. So, you know, that's not a, a, a super deep mentor relationship. But there's also books, if somebody took the time to write something down, you've brought up your your book that that you've written. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of John Maxwell. I quote him regularly on my podcast and, and on my social media and all kinds of, of things like 
to, to me, I view John Maxwell as a mentor of sorts. He took the time to write down all of these things that I can learn from and grow. And so that's a sort of different level. It's, a, it's this unseen mentor or, or learning opportunity that you have. And then most people, when they refer to a mentor, probably what you're talking about is an actual, you know, mentor relationship when you say, hey, listen, I really want to learn from you. I want to grow. I want to move to this position in business or as an entrepreneur or, I mean, who knows? I have a, a daughter that's a competitive gymnast, right? And so we always say that there's a, a big gym, sis, right? Who's that person that can do the skill and execute on the things that you're looking for? And it's worth having the actual conversation to say, hey, I want you to mentor me and teach me that. I want you to teach me and get me to that level to help me move because this is the level where I'm at and I see you at that next level. I see the opportunity for growth. And one of the things I think we fall into, and stop me anytime, Damon, if I'm rambling on, one of the things I think we fall into is once we get a mentor and we get that person, right? We get that, that, um, the next person, I, as you know, I coached hockey for 20 years. So you get somebody that's a gold level hockey player and you're silver or depending, you know, they're, they're 16 you and you're at 12 you that's for youth sports anyway, and so forth. And you, you know, they're, they're growing up. Well, then all of a sudden, somehow along the way, we put these constraints on ourselves and we go, well, that person always has to be my mentor. And one of the things you got to realize is just like anything else in life, if you're growing, you should grow to the point that mentor should educate you and bring you along and help teach you the processes that got them to that. And then you should be seeking out another next level mentor and another next level mentor and another. And, and so you will have some people that are a mentor and they may be a mentor for a lifetime. And we look at them, um, you know, my dad, my grandfather, those people that are with us for a lifetime, that they have this knowledge and, and we never get taught to be parents, right? But we learn through that sort of parental relationship and that mentoring relationship. They may be with you for a lifetime, but then there's other people uh, that they may be with you for a few years. They may be with you for a season. They may be with you for a year's time frame. And I think emotionally, um, we get attached and we think, oh man, no, I have this obligation to this person because they've mentored me. Well, then you're never going to grow past that either. And so I think mentors play a tremendous role. It, you as the mentee have to constantly be moldable and continuing, like we said at the beginning, to want to learn and grow, and get to that level, look for other mentors and keep moving. I hope that is what you're looking for. No, that was great. I, I've got I've got a comment. You mentioned that books can be a, a mentor in their in their own way. One of sure. the you know for some of the individuals that I mentor, especially those who are looking to get into leadership, uh, or even you know our customers that learn it, they'll say, "Well, where do you start?" One recommendation I have is go out and read 25 biographies of all mm -hmm. across all across the scope of of from different world leaders and successful people because you know for 15 20 bucks or even cheaper you could learn their successes and failures and a, and a lot so much just from from books um so i totally agree with you on that the question i have for you is how can a mentee add value to the relationship well the, a couple things one is you add value by taking the time to do what is asked of you to, to learn and to grow. And so, you know, I think there's a, a reciprocity when it comes to a mentor mentee relationship, like you have to show up, you have to be present. It, it can't just be, Oh, Hey, you're going to mentor me. And by some magic osmosis, all of a sudden, Oh my gosh, I got there. I had this divine intervention, right? You, you have to be an active participant. And I think it's worth, in my opinion, calling back signals to your mentor. Like when you have a success, there's nothing they want more than to hear about that success from you. And so often, like we'll keep it to ourselves. Oh, hey, I won. Or, and here's the thing. When you have a failure, and a long time ago, many years ago, probably 15 years ago, I, I totally wanted to redesign or redefine success and failure. Because, and I don't remember where I got the idea 
I don't remember what coach or mentor I got it from. They said, well, there are no failures. They're just smaller levels of success. So for example, sales background, I need to sell 20 widgets this month and I sold 15. Most people go, well, I failed in selling the 20. Well, but you succeeded in selling 15. So wrap that around it. And how did you do that? So I think it's important, first and foremost, call signals back to that mentor. Tell them when you succeeded. Tell them when you failed. Tell them what didn't work. It's worth having, you know, if they're taking the time to help grow you and either uh, in in one-on-one -on -one sessions, in writing a plan, maybe in a course, maybe in having you read, you know, books or do assignments, uh, then it's worth calling signals back to them and engage in the activity. Like there, there's nothing more powerful than being present in the now with a mentor-mentee relationship. That's exactly what I was hoping to hear. I always because I have several mentors myself. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, that I find is that they love sharing their knowledge. They, they love telling their story, especially if, if I come into the situation where instead of talking about myself at all, just asking them questions. And when I do need something, maybe I'm having a, a challenge with a, 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 an executive at work or something, reaching out to them and asking for their advice following back up with them, either shooting them a text or an email and saying, Hey, Steve, thanks for this advice. Here's what I did with it. They love that shit. They love oh, yeah. that, you know, and, well, and that keeps them going. Absolutely. And it, one thing to realize too is, and this may hurt some feelings. I, I don't think it will. I think people know this on some level. There's no one size fits all mentor. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, I can tell you my, my, one of my best friends in the world, his name is Matt Koenig great guy. I mean, and he is a hundred percent my mentor when it comes to my faith and spirituality. I know I can call him and lean into him and say, man, I'm having this tough thing. This is going on. And I also know what his answer is going to be. Hey man, slow down. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's pray about it before we get off the phone. And that's a powerful mentor to have in that, in that arena. So there's somebody that's spiritual, my mentor in business, Joe McCloskey, who's been my mentor in business for, for 20 years. The, the guy's just brilliant when it comes to, you know, automotive and running a business and how to lead people, how to lean in and engage people without being over the top. So, so realize that there's not one, and I'm just mentioning two of the people that are near and dear to me that have mentored me over the years and are, are continuing to in, in various ways. And it's something that th there's not a one size fits all. Now, can I call Matt and have a conversation with him on business? Absolutely. And vice versa. He's leaned into me. You know, there are things that I've helped grow him along with. But the, but those two two men, for example, they're, they mentor me and teach me and grow me on two different verticals in my life that are both completely necessary for me to grow as a human, for me to grow as a father, for me to grow as, as a leader and in my own business and entrepreneurial opportunities. No, I think that's great. The last comment before we switch gears sure. for, our, for our listeners out there, don't be afraid to reach out and ask to have somebody mentor you. Say, for instance, you're working at an organization and you have a meeting uh, and there's some, a senior leader on your team. Maybe ask him, him or her to go get a cup of coffee, sit down with them, and just don't be afraid to ask. What's the worst thing they could say? The worst thing they could say is no, but um, you'd be surprised. I, I think that as, as far as how your professional and personal growth goes, having mentors play a huge role. Now, Mike, can you give me a little background on your journey into leadership? Should have probably sure. started there, but I, w I just wanted to dive in on, hey, on the leadership. No, it, I'm, I'm good. My, you know, I, uh, yeah, 100%. I would say the first opportunities I had to lead probably was in high school. By the time I was 16, 17 years old, I got involved in coaching youth sports. I got involved in coaching youth hockey programs, inline hockey programs, worked at a roller skating rink in high school. And it was one of those that it was like, I, I didn't even realize at the time. It was just like, hey, man, I love this sport. These kids are pretty awesome. And uh, I can make some extra dough, right? And at that time, I was worried about car insurance and gas. And and uh, so, so what started out as just, hey, this is an opportunity. But in addition to working the regular job at the roller rink, between the time I was 16 and 18 years old, what's crazy is I'd make these connection with these young hockey players. And there were times I can remember 
that, and it was wild because I had these parents that at the time, you know, 35, 40, 45 years old, parents bringing their kids in. I think I was probably 18 years old, 17, 18 years old. The first time I had a parent ask me this and they said, Hey, would you talk to our son, man? He is just having the toughest time in school. He won't get his grades up and coach. He listens to you. I even, even now I get goosebumps saying something like that. I love I'm it. so humbled. Yeah. Uh, literally I'm saying it and I'm like, that's wild because I remember that first young man I had a conversation with and told him to get his grades up. And then the follow-up was, you know, probably three months later that what, how they were through a quarter in school and they came back and they said, Oh my gosh, we're so blessed. Thank you so much coach. And the parents like who are much my seniors, they're addressing me as coach. Right. I think that was one of the first clicks. Like that was one of the first times that I was like, I didn't ask for that role. Yeah. I mean, I asked for the role, but for completely different reasons, but because I threw myself in it and I was learning, I learned the sport. I learned the people, I learned the kids, um, that it presented this opportunity. And I remember them coming back and they're like, Hey, what did you say to him? Like he went from D's and F's to like straight A's. I think he got one B this quarter. What did you say to him? And I'm like, I just told him to do his homework. <laughs> <laughs> like, there was, you, you know, and they're like, no, no, no. But what else did you say? And it's like, you, you carry this whole different weight when people see you that way. And so I realized, like, we have this tremendous power in in leadership roles and not not in a negative way. Right. It's like Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. Oh. Like it was important when I had a parent come and ask me, I'd always stop and have those conversations. Fast forward. Then I got into management roles and uh, I was in a management role they're in small business for, for 10 years. And then we started running youth hockey programs. I probably coached 7,500 kids over wow. the course of my tenure. Uh, I still, to this day, my wife laughs about it. Uh, you know, I'm 48 years old now. And, and the last time I coached, I was probably actively coaching whether it was probably 24. I still have kids. I call them kids. They're all adults now on my Facebook that are like, Hey coach, you know, how's everything going and this and that. And it's like, to me that like, that's the win. That's the, the I, I, you can't even describe the feeling. And so going through those leadership roles, and a lot of that was self-taught and self-educated mm -hmm. because at the time it was just like, well, what am I doing that's, you know, to be morally right and help coach these kids and learn the game. And I led just a lot by blind action. You know, it was just, okay, well, it says to do this thing in the book. I'm going to go do that thing. And I wasn't seeking mentors. I didn't know to seek mentors. And then fast forward, I got into the auto industry in 2004. And, uh, you know, same thing. I, I just wanted to, I'll be very honest, kind of wanted to hide out in the auto industry and really learn sales. And I thought mm -hmm. I needed to learn sales. And the, it turned out, you know, all the years in, in management, I, I said before we went on the stream here, management and leadership often is selling. You're selling people on your way of doing things. I realized as a coach, I was selling all of those teams on uh, what my plays were and why they were the best, you know? And so uh, I got into the auto industry quickly it, it, without the desire to quickly got promoted into management, started running a store and, and moved on up. And that's actually, I mentioned uh, Joe McCloskey, earlier, who spent a lot of time investing in me and growing me and giving me the assignments like we're talking about, hey, go read this book, hey, learn this sales process. And then one of the things I'll never forget, and this is a huge question for anybody that is mentoring somebody coaching somebody is he was always following up with me. And he's like, hey, what did you learn? Go write it down, write down 10 things that you learned from whatever XYZ activity. And so that was something that's really powerful with me. And I think that helped propel me along. And so I've just, for the longest time, I've ended up you know, rising through the ranks and ending up in a, either a titled leadership role. But one of the things I realized, even as a, a salesperson on the floor, when I was selling actively, when you know your stuff and you're confident about it, people would come to you and ask, Hey, how are you doing this? How do you grow? And you still, there's an opportunity for leadership and mentorship and growth with a peer that may be on a lateral level with you. And, and that's often what will propel you forward or higher, you know, depending on how you, you look at that. Let's go back to, how you're able to connect with those kids. Because I think it's, I think it's important whether you're, you're coaching a youth team or mm -hmm. connecting with your, your direct reports mm -hmm. or in sales, connecting with your customers or your prospects, how are you able to first connect? Do you think with those kids? I think, well, and this is Carrie, that's a really good question, Damon, and I love it. And it's, it is uh, carried me, 
throughout my career at every level. And I didn't realize it then. It wasn't until I took the time to look back. And you're absolutely right. Whether it's in business, whether in parenting, right? First and foremost, first and foremost, you have to know and like people. You have to know them right? You have to know what their hopes and dreams and goals and aspirations are. And you have to support those no matter what level you think they're going to get. You don't impart your worldly constraints on what their dream is, right? And so you just listen and learn and you know what they desire. They, that the, the exchange then is they have to know that you genuinely care, right? There's no replacement for genuine caring. You can baffle people with bullshit, but the reality is there is not a replacement. When you genuinely care about someone and their well-being and their success, they, they know that. And I wish I could uh, articulate it better that, you know, that caring that – and dare I say, right, that genuine love for people, for the kids, for employees, even now, take the time to listen to what their hopes, dreams, and aspirations are. And then you can, because so often, if you know that stuff, you can look at them and something as simple as, hey, kid, do your homework, right? Not because your parents are asking you, not even because I'm asking you, but because if you want to be a grade A hockey player and make it to college, you know, and you're talking to a 12 year old or a 13 year old kid like this, you want to make it to college on a scholarship on a full ride, you know who they don't look at? The bonehead that's got D's and F's, right? And you can speak to people that way. And fast forward, you get into business, it's the same thing. You know, what drives those people? Because then you can lean on, lean in on them. And I have this saying, and I joke about this all the time, Damon. I say, well, you can't take hugs and high fives out of the ATM, right? We all show up to business to make money. But the reality is you can take hugs and high fives out of that like personal and emotional bank account. And so it's important that you high five the person. It's important, you, you know, and I got to be careful saying it today in 2024, but you hug on the person, right? Like uh, digitally hug on them like, hey, you know, or, and high fives and those sorts of things that they know you really care about what their success is and what their well-being is. And I think when you do that, you're saying like, well, hi, hey, how were you able to connect with them? The other thing is, is you're present in, in fairness as a coach as a leader, as a manager, you have to be humble and vulnerable enough. Here comes that word again. We talked about vulnerability to let them know who you are too. You know, like these kids knew who, you know, uh, they they knew a little bit about my, you know, my, my, my personal life, who I was, who my friends were, who my son was in the, in the program and that kind of stuff. Like they, and, and they don't need to know everything, you know, again, it's a fine line, but they have to know who you are and what drives you as well. Like what drives me to this day is my, you know, God first, my wife, mm-hmm. my kids, how can I make their life just one step better than where I had it? And when people know that that's what you're driving for that, you know, they want to see you get the win too. It's not just about their win. It becomes a very symbiotic relationship. Oh, I couldn't agree more on all that. What I like to what I like to say is, you you want you need to get to know your your team members on a personal and professional relationship. Now mm-hmm. you don't need to go crazy deep on it, but whether you run a five hundred person company or just have a couple employees, taking time out of your week, your month, carve out a little time, call them on Zoom or call them, go for a coffee walk, and just ask how they're doing, how they're doing. And, and being present, right, Mike? Not asking yeah. how they're doing and then look at your phone and do something else. That goes such a long way that it really gets your team members behind you. And I also think adding on top of that is showing a little gratitude. If something goes well, calling them up and giving them credit for the success. Oh, 100%. Absolutely, right? Giving, I, I think great leaders and, you know, I've seen poor leaders. I've had terrible baseball coaches who... When things go well, they take all the credit, right? Yep. But if, if things don't go well, they they push the blame out on on their on their players. Where I think great leaders, if things go well, you want to give credit to the frontline employees, uh, especially if it was their idea, because it creates so many more ideas and and makes them motivated and inspired. 
And if things don't go well, I think that's when leaders stand up and, and take, take the blame for it. You have to own and it. You have to own it. And I love what you say, letting them know more about yourself too. Now, again, you don't need to go super deep on any of this, but sure. if they feel like that they're kind of connected, like I, I love to talk about, I've got two little kids, a uh, seven-year-old and a three-year-old, you know, talk a little bit about your kids, some of the things that you have going on. And, and people feel, I think, much more connected that way. A hundred percent. I'm going to dovetail on that because for stuff like, for example, both my my two kids that are still at home, I have three, but my two that are still at home, uh, they, they still enjoy going to play the, the Pokemon game. So they got me into that. Yes, it is a 48-year-old dude. I'll play the Pokemon game with my kids, right? <laughs> And yeah. it, what's crazy is when somebody knows about that, that about you, or the fact that I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, I love Star Wars. Or on the flip side, people are like, I've never even seen a Star Wars. And I'm like, then we can't be friends, right? This is not the friendship you're looking for. And we always joke about it and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so, so those sorts of things make you human. And the other mm -hmm. thing, like when you were saying, hey, yeah, you have to come down and, and if you're asking how someone's day is, be present. Look them in the eye. One of the most wonderful things, and I learned this early on, I want to say it was a trainer named, I think, Richard Carell uh, with the Carell uh, organization, K-E-R-E-L. And he's like a memory coach. And he's, I think he has some world records for memory and all kinds of stuff like that. But I, I, I took a course. I mean, this is years ago. And one of the things that he was talking about was remembering names. And I think it's so powerful. I know we talk about the hugs and fi high fives, but if I go, man, Damon, you just crushed that podcast today. High five, right? And, and you're like, dude, I did kind of crush that podcast today. Or, uh, you know, whatever avenue it is. Oh, man. Hey, Mike, great job on, on selling that. Or, uh, Damon, great job on signing up additional clients. Or, hey, kid, great job scoring that goal, that juke move that you did killer, man. I want you to teach me how to do that. And by remembering their name and having that genuine excitement, that genuine connection with somebody, it'll propel you just into the stratosphere forward. Absolutely. I've always been shocked and surprised. And you remember people who remember names. 100%. You know, there's, there's a woman at this restaurant, um, cocktail waitress, who also watches our dog, Donna. And it's my favorite restaurant. Her and her husband, Steve, watch uh, our, our dog when I'm out of town. But I'll bring a friend into the restaurant, Mike, and then that same person might come back six months or a year later. Donna remembers her name. And the second day that she walks away, they're like, wow, that's incredible. It makes people feel good. So yeah. just taking the time to remember people's name, it, it really helps with those connections. Well, in business, especially, it feels like, okay, well, I'm not just a number in business. I made my mark. Absolutely. And they know I made my mark and I'm important. And that's, and that's important for your employees as well. Because if people are just paycheck players, that's typically, I, I think it's because the leader's not doing a good job of, of showing them the why or the purpose, but, uh, and, and people aren't feel like they're part of something. If you can get people to feel like they're part of something, they're going to want to show up and they're going to want to contribute. A hundred percent. I think that's something that's super valuable when it comes to leadership. You, you asked earlier, what are some of the most powerful traits w when it comes to leaders? I think not just having vision, but being able to cast vision to people is tremendously important as well. Is that, is that the most important thing? Is it the 10th most important thing? I don't know. I think it probably depends on the organization. But to be able to articulate that and to tell people, hey, here's where we're going and here's what you're going to need to bring with you and here's what I'm going to bring with me and here's what Marty over here is going to bring with him and here's what Susan's going to bring with her and you get all that and, and, and you get the vision set up and then you get people bought into that same excitement level, that, you know, the, the excitement and the enthusiasm that alone will build confidence and help carry people through to what the goal is to hit that vision. I think that's a great point. And it kind of comes into, it made me think about this for a second. So we're, you know, we're halfway through the year 2024. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an interesting year. You know, <laughs> people are least. concerned to say the least, right? People are concerned about the economy. There's a lot of uncertainty around the election coming up and, and where everything's at. What advice do you have? And I think this ties into vision. How, what advice do you have to lead during uncertainty? How can leaders really step it up and lead during uncertain times? Uh, I think there's a couple of things. And uh, 
I did a video on this on my cha YouTube channel, gosh, four years ago. Ironically, four years ago. Why four years ago? Because we were going through <laughs> uncertain political times then. I think, number one, people that are viewed as leaders, right now you need to be steadfast more than ever. You need to show your level of confidence. You need to, to show, and let's talk from a business standpoint. You need to show, not just tell, but show people that your level of confidence is there and that things are going to be okay. People need to know, and every four years we have it. Oh my gosh, things are going to go. It's a total shit show and, and all of this. But you can't the, bullshit people though. People I'm not, will understand if you're bullshitting them. No, it, it, yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying to bullshit them, but one of the things to realize, and this was advice from a peer of mine, his grandfather said, look, if it doesn't affect my family, my town, my local community, then I, then I don't worry about it too much. And I think one of the things that happens is we have a tendency as Americans right now to get really wrapped up in all of the outside stuff. And some of it doesn't affect us. It starts at home. And so when I'm saying like, you have to have that steadfast confidence, have the confidence to communicate that with your people and tell them, Hey, it is going to be okay. The other yeah. thing is, you know, where, where you're talking about this uncertainty, I think it is important. My, my view as a leader the people that work for me, I constantly am communicating and having conversations with them. And let me tell you, there are people that are on the right side of the political spectrum to the right, and there are people that are on the left side of the political spectrum, i.e. to the left. When I'm saying right, I'm not saying correct. I'm saying right or left, right? <laughs> um, and I think one of the keys is, for, I wish I could have the whole world hear this. Don't believe the bullshit that somebody else is telling you, because the reality is most people, even sitting on different sides of the spectrum, most people, most normal, sane people can have a reasonable conversation about two completely and have two completely opposing views and be respectful about it. But the reality is what we're being fed from a high level of politics to media to everything else is that, oh, well, you can't get along and the other side is evil and it's bullshit. If this person believes differently than you do, then they're a terrible human being and you should cut them off. And we get to the point of turning in neighbors and all the other stuff. And it's like, no, the reality is there are lots of people that have different views than you right now. And we should, in my opinion, talk about it. As a leader, you should have that conversation and be respectful about it. And it's important to get people talking uh, so that, you know, the, the less people talk, the more that we get in our heads and we think what somebody else, it, you, well, I think this person thinks this, therefore I hear, uh, I fear or hate them. Mm -hmm. Well, none of the shit that you're probably saying to yourself is ever going to come to fruition about that thing. And none of the stuff they're saying to themselves is probably ever going to come to fruition, right? We've all heard the analogy fear or, uh, or acronym fear, false evidence appearing real. It's all made up in our head. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm not saying I'm not advocating to bullshit people. The other thing is, you know, be, be real. Like if you look at, I watched the debates and I had several people say, and I'll, I'll share this, just this little piece. I had several people say, well, 338 million people in the U S and, and this is the best we've got. And it's like, no, there's lots of other amazing people. The thing is we're not talking about it. So talk about it, have that conversation, talk about how amazing Damon is, or talk about how amazing the Matt Canings are, the Joe McCloskey's and why they're valuable and have conversations with people that may have different views than you and understand that that's okay. And most of the time, it's never going to affect you, your business, your community, or your family. Most of the time. No, I think those are great points. Even in the business world or in personally, it's great to get out of your comfort zone and have conversations with, with people who have different perspectives and diverse views from you and not get defensive because it goes back to you can learn. And what I heard you say earlier about things getting in people's head that, that is so important, too, for leaders, for all you leaders out there, because let's say your business is struggling, right? Your business is struggling. Your numbers are down. Everybody knows your numbers are down. But let's say that your leadership team is not being transparent. They're not talking about it. Well, what's happening is people in their minds are thinking about are thinking about the worst case scenario. Right. And so when I said what I meant by that, don't bullshit them is. I, one of my idols, I really, I really love Winston Churchill because, you know, during the beginning of World War II, one thing that he did that I thought was amazing 
was he was communicating and over communicating and he'd always start off and he'd say, Hey, here's what things look like. They're things aren't going very well for us. Uh, and he could even mention some of the failures had, but then Mike, he'd come in and say, things are going in this you point you brought up, things are going to be okay. And here's how we're going to get there. Absolutely. And I think, I think that that transparency and also having an open door for your team members to feel comfortable to bring things up and ask is what will help organizations and, you know, even our country get through these difficult times, mm -hmm. the opportunity to talk them through and the transparency that goes with it. Well, I, and I think Damon, when, when, when you're saying, okay, we'll say you work for a company that's not being very transparent. Well, what defines not being very transparent? Then you got to look and say, well, maybe it's just because we're not sharing this thing or that thing or whatnot. It, it becomes perception, right? And mm -hmm. people's perception is the reality. Whatever I believe is true. And so if, if you're not sharing the real state of where the company is at, or if you're not sharing the real state of, of, of what it is, you think, oh man, and to use your, your words, like Winston Churchill, if he had if he had not gone up there and said, "Hey, things aren't going very well," but here's what we're going to do. If he had just kept all that inside, hey, the things aren't going very well, but uh, I don't want to say that to anybody because then they're going to know it, <laughs> right? But right, the reality right, right. is, I most people would rather know and believe the truth that it's not going well than make up their own lie on why it's not going very well. Mike, a hundred percent. Because if you don't tell them, they're just like, oh my gosh, it's probably not going well because this, and then is it me? And then they start to not perform or gosh, that leader sucks, right? Maybe it's you. <laughs> and, and so you, you go through this and they have to, the reality is if you're not communicating it and telling them what's actually happening, or at least your perception of what's actually happening, then they have to create their own reality of to why it, why it isn't going good. So, you know, that's, that's, and again, going all the way up, whether, whether you're talking at a, at a family level, it's the same thing. You know, if you're not communicating with your spouse, all, all things that end up get bro end up getting broken is due to failed communication. It, when it comes to family business, uh, you know, not all things like things can physically break. But when we talk about relationships, business, entrepreneurism, the you know, the political spectrum right now, it, it, it all boils down to failed or broken communication. And people have to fill in the gaps and start making things up. And that happens in, I mean, you've probably seen the memes also, like where the husband and wife are laying in bed together, right? The little cartoon and the wife's right. going, the wife's going, Oh my God, I wonder what he's thinking about. Is he seeing someone at work? I hope everything's going okay. Gosh, this and that and the, all the other things. Like she's filling in the gaps of why he's not talking to her. And he's, he, he's rolled on the other side going, uh, and I'll use, you know, my, my own experience as an example. Man, I can't wait for the next episode of The Accolade to come out because I love Star Wars. And it's too <laughs> complete, right? Because there's no communication and Absolutely. so everybody fills in the gaps and, and vice versa, right? The guy goes, oh my gosh, I wonder why she's not talking to me. And I, I, th this is, you know, we never bring that up. And meanwhile, she's thinking, gosh, I can't remember if it's one cup or two cups of sugar in, the, in dinner tonight or, or whatever, right? And I, I know I'm being very stereotypical when it comes to the men or women thing, but it's just like we fill in these gaps because we don't know what that other person is thinking. The same thing happens in business, you know? So it's, it's better just to... It, and an imperfect articulation is better than none at all. I agree with you a hundred percent. I think it's important, especially during uncertain times mm -hmm. to over communicate, be as transparent as possible and work with your team. Like we said, being vulnerable again, Hey, I may not have all the answers and, but what I'm willing to do is listen and we're going to find a way out of this and we're going to and show them a vision, a roadmap to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I also, I also think, and this goes for during any time, and I've heard you speak about it on your, on your show is the importance that leaders are, they're always on stage, you know, mm -hmm. they're your, your, your body language, how you're behaving, your mood, everybody's looking to you as well, even as a parent, right? Your kids, everybody's looking to you and your actions. So I, it's just incredibly important to be mindful of uh, that you're, you're always on. People are always gonna be looking at you, your team members and your family. Absolutely. Well, when, you're, when you are a leader, 100%, there is always someone looking at you. 
there's at least one person and you're right. I think I've said similarly, like you're always on stage and so forth. One way that I've compared this and this happens to me in business, whatever thing that you do, you're an amplifier. So if you're positive and you're high fiving and you're excited and you're pumped and you're telling people, Hey, this is how it is. And this is where we're going. Uh, if then that's going to be amplified. If you are somebody that uh, you you brought it up, Damon, like you're trying to cast the vision and you're wanting other people's ideas and you say, hey, what, what are the best ways we can win to get out of this position that we're in? And people start spitting ideas and you're writing it up on the board and you're getting all jazzed and excited about it. That's that jazz and excitement is going to be amplified. I've always said this as a as a business leader. If I catch a cold, my team gets pneumonia. I love that. And That's a great statement. Can yeah. you explain it? Yeah, it's it's the same thing. It, while I'm saying it's amplified on the, the positive side, it's also amplified on the negative side. So if I have a case of the ass one day and I'm like, oh, man, this client's such a jerk, they're – whatever. And I'm just picking something. Oh, th this client, they were, they were such a jerk. And then before you know it, you're going to have three of your team members going, Hey, did you hear that client was such that they, they were completely, they said they were going to come down here and kick Mike's ass. It went from them just being rude to now all of a sudden you're getting in a fist fight. Right. And then five people later, five layers later, they're like, Hey, did you hear their betting in Vegas on these guys that are going to fight? It's unbelievable. And so it gets this amplification and it goes very, very quickly. And so, you know, it, it's really important. Another saying that I have in business, you can't allow that one person. If you're the leader and you, you did, you dealt with somebody that's a jerk, you dealt with some, that's something that maybe you should internalize for a minute. Don't allow that one person to dictate how you're going to deal with the next 99 instances in your life. You know, because what happens is we take that one and we focus on it. We talk about the jerk and, uh, you know, I, I, in digital marketing, I worked within a call center for some time. And it's amazing. They'll ha you know, the, these women, you'll look in this, this call center and it's primarily women that work for me, but women and men, these people in the call center, well, they'll, they'll deal with a hundred, 120 phone calls in a day. And what's the one they always remember that person that was a jerk. And they're still talking about it at the end. And it's like, dude, let it go, right? Frozen, let it go, yeah. <laughs> let it go. Because otherwise that gets amplified and then their friends are talking about it and then you're talking about it. And then it's like, now I'm negative. And, and so you, you need to be really mindful and cognizant of how it is you're carrying yourself. How are you speaking? And one of the first places to start, this goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. Who do you have the most conversations with in the world? It happens right here in between about these eight inches, right? You're, you're, it's the way you talk to yourself is the way you're going to present to the world also. And so you need to be very aware of that when, you, when you're moving into a leadership and management role. It all, it all starts with self-leadership. Absolutely. The now we're almost coming up on time. I mean, I could probably sit here for a couple more hours. But one of the one of the you know, in, in some of my research on you, I, I definitely wanted to cover this. Yeah. What do you mean when you say you're running on double A's? Running on double A's, man. I that's awesome that you say that. I wrote I wrote a blog years, years ago called Running Your Life on Double A's. And it's actions and attitude. That's it. That's my two A's. Actions and attitude. And one will always dictate the other, right? Your actions are going to help dictate what your attitude is. Your attitude is going to help dictate what actions you're willing to take. And so, you know, we're always talking about energy and being pumped up and moving and moving forward and executing and and taking action on stuff. And so uh, I, I don't remember the full blog article. I'll have to go back now and look. It's probably 15 years ago, man, that I we'll wrote that. Put it in it's the fun. show notes. If we could, if we could it, find it, we'll put it in okay. the show notes. Yeah, uh, I, for sure. And I, I've had several different iterations of my website since then. But I, I wrote that, and it has just stuck with me, part of which I had a, a sales manager. Gosh, this is so many years ago. And he was talking about uh, enthusiasm and how it, uh, enthusiasm sells. And it was the, the uh, equation for it was knowledge breeds confidence, confidence breeds enthusiasm, and enthusiasm sells. And I thought, man, you can apply that to so many things. Knowledge breeds confidence, confidence breeds enthusiasm, enthusiasm leads also. And so when we're talking about running your life on double A's, it's really, really important to make sure that you're constantly gaining that knowledge, the more that you know, 
the more that you're digging into a subject, you know, something like the learn it all podcast, you, you get in there and you learn and you listen and you push to grow yourself. And the, the more that you learn the, and the more knowledgeable you are, that makes you more confident in the way you present and what you're talking about in that subject or in any subject. What's really important going back even before knowledge is be deliberate on what you're putting into your mind, right? Be deliberate in the choices that you make to, to gain that knowledge. Then you become more confident that confidence you, you can't help, but be excited and enthusiastic and that helps dictate you dictate your actions, you know? So between the knowledge and confidence to me, that's the, the running your life on double A's because when I'm confident about something, it's easier for me to take action. It's easier for me to take imperfect action and sometimes fail. You know, we were talking beforehand that, that, uh, you know, you get imposter syndrome and we, we get in our own heads and go, wow, gosh, I, I, I don't know, Damon, if this is the, the action that I should take, just take the action. Trust me, not that many people are watching anyway, right? When it comes. <laughs> and Mike, not only are not that many people watching anyway, in most cases, you're not that important. People right. have the people, have, people have their own lives, right? So right. you go up and let's say you post something on LinkedIn and, 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 and maybe you didn't think it went as well, or you do a presentation and that doesn't go as well. People might see that for 10 seconds and they move on with their own life. So yep. I think it's, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I have a follow-up question about the knowledge, which I think is important. Yeah. How do you know, we're so busy these days, right? Everybody's busy, especially as a leader. As a busy professional, how do you go about continuous with, continuously finding ways to continue learning? So that's a really good question. And I always refer to, I think it was Tony Robbins that said, you got to use net time. You have no extra time, but it's those times that, you know, because we, we say to ourselves, I have no extra time. But that downtime is like driving from home to work. Uh, the, the downtime is being deliberate and I'm going to get up an hour earlier or stay up uh, an hour later to work on that thing. It's, it's so important to be deliberate in working on yourself, either spiritually, intellectually, uh, financially, like spending time to learn those things. So it, it could be, you know, listening to a Kindle book on the way to, to work or on the way to a client's or on an airplane, when you're headed off to speak somewhere, you throw that, throw that book on and, and, you know, spend the time to invest in that. We get so tied up that, oh, well, I got to post the next thing on social media that like you said, it's really not that important. Or man, I've got all these emails I have to respond to. I'll give you a tip. The emails aren't going anywhere. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ever respond, but set time. I, I think time blocking is valuable. So, you know, for first thing in the morning, let me let me be deliberate in setting like if, if we're deliberate in setting a time to to work out and we're deliberate in setting a time to work out mentally, you know, so whatever that looks like to you. Hey, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I'm going to have an hour uninterrupted to read a book and pick that book and read all the way through it. There, there were some statistics. I don't remember what it is. It was a very high percentage. I want to say it was like 90 percent, but I, I would be misquoted. You know, they say figures lie and liars figure. So I, I won't give a percentage. Uh, but there's some ridiculous percent that say, you know, uh, once people are out of high school, many of them never read another book to, to its full length, never read all the way through it. And it's like, so you're different. If you're different, be deliberate in saying, okay, well, three times a week, I'm going to work on reading this book five days a week, I'm going to get up 15 minutes early. And like, for me, I spend time praying in the morning. Uh, when I'm driving to work, I'm going to pick this Kindle book and, and, uh, listen to that. If I'm on, rather than just, we, we all have more time than we think rather than mm -hmm. watching the, you know, uh, binge watching the friends marathon that came back on TBS. I may be dating myself there, but uh, instead of doing that, it's like, okay, well, if you're going to do that for six hours, what else could you do to generate deliberate growth in your life for that six hours? And every once in a while, I get it. We need time to unwind. I heard, are you familiar with Alex Hormozzi? I heard you talk about him on another show. So, so I, I, he's somebody that I follow and I listen and learn. He has a very unique perspective. He's not somebody that How I would do you spell his last name. Hormozzi, H-O-R-M-O-Z-I. And, and he has really different perspectives on business. He has a whole story where he started out in a gym, you know, sleeping on the gym floor, building up, uh, uh, 
physical fitness business and so forth. One of the things I heard him say the other day, he says, I don't have a set schedule. He says, but what I do know is if I have a night that I didn't sleep well, that's the next day that I'll take off. Because there's no reason wasting a day off on a night that I've had really good sleep and good energy. And I thought, that's a really unique perspective. I've never heard somebody say that. And so that's one of the things too is, yes, there is a time to kick back and binge watch the the Friends Marathon. But it's going to be one of those days where you go, hey, I already know I'm off and I just need some time to retreat and just have my brain not think about business or not think about this or that thing and be able to relax and unwind. Yes, there's a time and place. The problem is it becomes almost addictive when you're doing it then every day, you, you know, and, and, and realistically, Damon, I'm, th- those are probably not the people we're talking to on your podcast. Those aren't people doing 100%. it every day. Um, I, I couldn't but, agree more. E- even so, you say, well, you know, you have an hour or two at night that you're doing something that you could be deliberate in rescheduling and time blocking for something else. I guess that's the, the whole moral of the story, the whole point. No, I think that's, I think that's great advice. And um, talk about friends, old episodes of friends and star Wars. I've Love got them. team members, people that work here who are unfamiliar with Duran Duran. So really, <laughs> yeah, no so, yeah. we're getting up there, Mike. Yeah. Hey, let me, uh, here's a signature question we have. Yes. Uh, as we wrap up, what is, can you tell us, you've been an open book today, but can you tell us one thing about you that most people are unaware of? You know, uh, I, I could come, well, I'll, I'll share this one because, and I've shared it on, on other, another podcast, but in general, uh, I died from COVID in 2021, both my lungs collapsed. I literally died on the way to the hospital, uh, was saved, spent several months in, I had a whole epiphany, um, it was a whole experience. You know, people talk about the, the white light. I don't know how much you want to get in this. It could go on to a whole nother hour, but I uh, had a whole experience uh, while I was there. And literally while I was completely checked out, sat up, grabbed the doctor's wrist, they were going to intubate me. And I said, that's not what I need. And then blacked back out. And I don't remember that. I had the doctor told me that. And so um, that's not a real common knowledge. I mean, we didn't even share my, my whole COVID experience when I had it there. Um, but that was a, that was a pretty wild run. Um, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole, I mean, that's a whole nother story. I, I have, uh, I, I journaled while I was in the hospital. I'll, uh, I'll email it to you, Damon, if you, if you'd like. Do it. If, yeah. I got, like it's probably it 20 pages of the whole experience. It was wild. Wow. What a incredible journey. Incredible story. Um, well, we've had a great hour I and mean, we've cut, we've touched on a lot, right, Mike? Yeah. And we talked about the key traits for leaders, the importance of mentors, time blocking and being deliberate to find times to learn, connecting with people in leadership. So many great things. Before we sign off, is there anything else we want to, uh, we'll get to where people can find you, but sure. is there anything else quickly that you want to mention for everybody out there? You know, I, one thing that I would say for anybody that's listening, whether you're new to leadership or if you've been in it for, for some time, entrepreneur, business, leadership, when an opportunity presents itself, take it. And I don't mean irresponsibly take it. I mean, weigh the pros and cons, look at what the opportunity is and move. And I wish I'd had someone tell me that when I was much, much younger, that it's like, okay, well, if this opportunity is here, because and I had one of my son's football coaches told me this one time. He says, you know, you got to realize, Mike, opportunities don't stay there forever. They're, they're right here right now. And they may, you know, there, there may be different lengths, different seasons for them. But if there's an opportunity and it's something you're passionate about and you see this, you could go after it, then take it. And I will tell you probably many seasoned leaders that may be reminding them of something they've forgotten. They might be going, and yeah, that, oh, and hopefully that's the case. And if you're new to leadership and you start to see these opportunities, make sure, you know, it, seize the day, take, take those because they, they may not present themselves again. I think that's a in, incredible advice. I share a lot of times, if you see a job posting or an internal promotion and you look at the qualifications and you mm-hmm. think to yourself, well, maybe I don't, I don't have all these skills. You know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not qualified for this job. 
But if you're passionate about it and you think you can be great at it, for us leaders out there who are hiring, go for it. Take, mm-hmm. take the opportunity, apply, stick your neck out there. I mean, I want you to. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times people have applied for roles, Mike, where maybe they didn't meet the those wannabe requirements and they're fantastic fits for it. So Absolutely. just go for it, right? That's that's one of those things. Man, I, I couldn't have said it better. Like, especially then, especially then that that's when you, you know, that's the run in your life on double A's. Take the, have the right attitude, take the action. Really good leaders will see your passion and your enthusiasm for that. I, I've always said this in business. I, I'll, I'll hang on this. Hire really good leaders will hire for character and they'll train the skill necessary to get there. Yeah. I always say hire for aptitude and attitude. Yep. Yep. So Mike, where can our, I mean, I've already talked about your awesome podcast, the leadership toolkit. Where can our leaders, uh, where can our listeners connect with you? Sure. Uh, if, if you like, if somebody wants to, they can certainly email me. It's just Mike at lead the team.net. That's L E A D T H E T E A M. Dot net. Uh, you're welcome to email me there. My website is, as you might have guessed, leadthetheteam.net. And I write a blog there and, and have some other resources. And uh, certainly I would love if people would, would check out and tune into the podcast. I think you'll be on my podcast here maybe the next few weeks or months, something along those lines. And uh, I'm excited yep. to, to reverse roles with you. And uh, you can find that at theleadershiptoolkit.com. Well, thank you, Mike. You're thank awesome. You. And for our listeners out there, if you enjoyed today's episode, like it, subscribe. And until next time, everybody, keep learning, stay curious, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks, Damon.